Welcome everyone to my YouTube channel, Video Chess Training. I'm International Master William Pascal, and today we're taking a look at Grandmaster Chess Lessons Part 1. This is a great game that I personally witnessed. It was played in 2010 at the Gotthard Cup in 2010 in Hungary, in St. Gotthard, Hungary. Two legendary players doing battle here. I brought you a real masterpiece, White the Legendary, Lajos Portish playing in 2010 at 73 years young. Black, Grandmaster Alexander Beliavsky, formerly in the top five in the world in the late 80s, early 90s. So many battles with Kasparov and Karpov Beliavsky's had. So, Beliavsky in his late 50s, Portish 73 when this game was played, rarely gets to play one or two tournaments a year at the most. Now he's 79. He's hardly playing at all, but this was a fantastic masterpiece. I got to spend a little bit of time with Portish at the tournament, and uh, and he's such a great person. So let's take a look at what happened here. He was struggling against uh, Beliavsky in their lifetime score in the last uh, 15 years or so, and uh, before this game took place. So throughout the, the 90s, Portish started to decline as Beliavsky was still very strong. So it had been a while since Beliavsky had had troubles with Portish. Let's see what happened in this game. Lajos plays d4. He's a positional player and uh, regarded by the Hungarian uh, chess intelligentsia as the Botvinnik of Hungarian chess. Just a masterful positional player, one of the greatest Hungarian chess players ever to play the game. Beliavsky, an aggressive player. He specializes in very sharp openings. Knight f6, c4. By the way, I highly recommend you pick up Beliavsky's game collection, which he's published and uh, I think is available. Great games, fantastic attacking player, Beliavsky. Uncompromising, and, and I strongly recommend both of these players to study and learn from their play. A c4 from Portish, g6 from Beliavsky. Knight c3 and d5, the Grunfeld defense. What does a positional player do against a very dangerous Grunfeld player? When you're 73 years old, you want to keep it kind of under control. So Lajos plays e3. This is not bad. It's a, it's a very defensive sort of setup. You'd normally see it um, like if colors were reversed and um, a Grunfeld reversed. Maybe that's black's best way of defending against the, the Grunfeld with colors reversed. Here it's like a defensive setup, but perfectly playable, hard for black to crack. And Beliavsky plays bishop g7. Now we expect knight f3, and the normal line, knight f3, castles, queen b3, or c takes d. But we knew something special was going to happen when Portish played c takes d, knight takes d5, knight takes d5. I literally, I had never seen this done in a tournament game in my entire life, uh, in 25 years plus in chess. And here's Lajos Portish playing knight takes d5 against Alexander Beliavsky. It looks like a beginner's move where white just trades the centralized knight um, to bring out the black queen on d5 where it's actually very active. So what's the point here? White plays knight e2. And he's going to chase that queen with possibly knight f4, but probably knight c3. And in the event of a sharp central break like c5, white has knight c3 and d5, keeping the center closed, keeping a space advantage. So Portish, um, very tricky line, and I think a good like sideline to kind of put in your arsenal if you want to take that Grunfeld player out of book um, and take the fun out of the Grunfeld a little bit. Castles, knight c3, and here I'm not sure where Beliavsky should go. I mean, the game continuation queen d6 is fine. I suppose you could even consider queen d8, but it's a little bit passive. And uh, finally, queen a5 looks like a Scandinavian-esque move that has to be reasonable. White could play bishop d2. No particular discoveries, but a knight b5 in the air. And uh, Beliavsky knows what he's doing, so I'm, I'm sure he probably looked at this at some point in his career. Um, Queen d6, and bishop e2, quietly developing. White isn't really set up for anything too sharp. I suppose you could play bishop c4, but um, that's not really part of the plan. 
So bishop e2, the bishop could be active on f3. And it could go to the long diagonal like a fianchetto bishop if black tries an early b6 or something. And the important thing to understand here is if black tries to play super actively with c5 or e5, white's going to close the center with d5 with a safe position and, and maybe a, a tiny edge. So it's not easy to say what black should do here. Um, knight a6 is an interesting move, for example. And um, instead of that, I guess the text, which seems okay, albeit like a little bit passive, knight d7. Again, if e5, I think that white is very comfortable. Uh, I think I asked Portish about this, d5. It seems comfortable for white. Very strong pawn at d5. The square e4 for the white knight in some lines. e4 is coming. Um, white is just a tiny bit better. Obviously, it's not a really dynamic system for white, but it's a very safe line and frustrating for the aggressive Grunfeld player. So in the actual game, we have knight d7, castles, and then I think a very hesitant move from Beliaski, c6. The active move here instead, c5, would get complicated. And again, I didn't write down anything that Portish told me at that tournament, but I have a funny feeling I saw them analyze this, or um, or maybe Portish told me. But um, there, is, there is some possibility of this line, knight b5, queen b6, and uh, and here maybe d5. This looks like a very reasonable way to deal with the position. So anyway, after c6 in the game, things get even more interesting. I mean, what would most players do in this position? Something quiet. I don't know. Queen c2, idea rook d1, or b3, which looks a bit dangerous because of the long diagonal. It's hard for white to develop, so what do you do? Well, I would think that um, f4 is a bit anti-positional looking, but this, this is an interesting move. If f4, we take over the whole center, and um, if c5, again, we can play d5. This is one possibility for white that I think is legitimate. It's hard for black to break out against this stone wall type of formation. But Portish has a similar idea just a little bit later. He plays knight e4. And what an original concept this is, really. I mean, there's no great square for the black queen. And it, it wants to stay, like, in, in a good position. So queen c7. I mean, really, there's nothing else. And then, again, maybe f4 here, although I think black at this point is on the verge of threatening, like, c5. And, and um, so... Bishop d2. This has got to be home preparation from Portish. I mean, it's not really that dangerous for black, but you can see black's dying to play e5 in this position. If if e5, bishop b4, and suddenly it looks like black has some some pretty serious issues where, you know, he's certainly not better. So, Beliaski here, with his fighting style, you can kind of um, do a little bit of bullfighting against a player like that. I think goad him into taking risks and uh, and and he'll do it, you know, so he doesn't want to play like the best move, which is trading pieces with knight f6 especially against a player who he's beaten a lot in the last 20 years in his decline. Uh, Beliaski wants to play for a fighting game, so he plays knight b6 instead and this move, you know, the knights on, on knight 3 are not normally well placed and this is no exception knight, knight needs to get back in the game, white has a strong center and check it out now, f4. Portish understands very, very deeply positional chess. So he takes away any chance of black freeing himself in the center with e5. He's already shut down c5, and he's now shut down e5. So Beliaski has no freeing moves that you'd normally make in, in the Grunfeld. And watch Beliaski just kind of squirm around here, not really sure you know, what he's supposed to do. If you guys saw my previous video uh, of, of the game, Kramnik versus Anish Giri, I think you see something kind of similar happening stylistically there, where the positional player just kind of like gets a lock on the position and never lets this more like aggressive tactical player get any kind of play. And Portis just, once he gets a stranglehold on you, he doesn't really let go um, like a boa constrictor. So knight d5, and black's still probably okay. It's very gradual the way that white kind of squeezes black here. Um, 
Obviously, the idea was rook c1 at some point for white. And now bishop c4, activating that piece. Black doesn't have any breaks anymore. No e5, no c5. Portish isn't a passive player. He doesn't want to play quietly if he has to, but the bishop you know, was just playing the position. Now it's going to a more aggressive square at c4. Bishop f5, and always when we see these kind of moves, with no pawn breaks, it's hard to play the Grunfeld. And bishop f5 is just, it's a move, it feels active, but black doesn't really have a plan here. Portish plays knight to g3, possibly taking the bishop pair in some positions. Belieski, without a lot of space, could have played, probably should have played bishop e6 here with um, tactical ideas, like knight takes e3. But ultimately, I think he was afraid he might be like setting up f5 for white down the line, and he didn't feel it was a stable position for black. So he just offered to give up to bishop pair. Rook on a to d8. This is probably the best move, but black's left with no breaks as usual. Portish could take the bishop pair. I think most computer engines would jump at the chance to take the bishop pair, but Portish's understanding is a little deeper, and, uh, and he realizes that that white squared bishop doesn't really have a clear, you know, job in this position, so he's not in a hurry to take it off. Um, rook c1, further like pressuring the c file, discouraging black from breaking, and then queen d7, just getting off the c file, pressuring down the d line. Black has to, for his part, keep pressure on d4. The bishop on g7, down the d line. He doesn't want white to overrun him with e4 or something like that. So queen d7, and then a very subtle move here. Again, we could take the bishop pair with knight takes f5, portish, queen e1. I mean, this isn't the move that an ordinary player, you know, comes up with over the board. This is the move of a great master, queen e1. With the queen, you can see it has, like, getting off the, the d-line defensive points, but um, ideas of maybe going to h4 later on. It supports the, the advance e4 for white, and another diagonal e1, a5 is relevant here. And we see Believsky now worried about e4. He can actually lose a piece next move. So he has to do something about moving one of those pieces. Retreats his knight back to f6. Then Portish starts to massage black's pawn structure here with bishop a5. This strategic massage is uh, kind of similar to what Kramnik did against Anish Giri. Bishop a5, and all the black pieces kind of having trouble coordinating. He doesn't really want to weaken his pawn structure, but he wanted the rook on the d-file, so what's he supposed to do? Could play rook c8, maybe better than weakening the pawn structure. Um, b6, now the c6 weakness along the c-line looks rather silly. Portish grabs the bishop pair now, knight takes f5, and uh, you could take with the queen here, but it's not an uncommon capture with Belyowski. A little bit risky what he does here but um, it gets really good control of e4, and black could dream of maybe using the half-open g-file, but the risks a little bit are about the king position, and it is a relevant risk. Queen takes f5 was an alternative, but it, it, this way gives him a little more grip on the e4 square. g takes f5, bishop c3, and now knight e4. And the thing is, if black ever takes on c3, Portish is going to take back with the pawn just ultra solidifying his pawn structure in the center. And the game would be favorable for white, because then even if black gets in c5, he still can't break break up white's center. So it's not that easy. If you take take the bishop on c3, um, white has a free, like a free roll, basically. I mean, he'll just play h3, king h1, g4, opposite bishops, good for the attacking side, better pawn center, and white is better. So. Belieski kind of reticent to, to grab that that bishop, obviously. Not not the greatest piece at the moment. But improving his pieces now strategically. Queen e2. Queen e2 probing the white squares. And black here could have played c5. I think this is the best move. c5, and black can hold the balance, I think, after c5, rook fd1, queen b7 keeping the queen on a relatively safe square where it influences the center. And the game is about equal. This was, I think, Belieski's last chance to maintain an equal game. Instead, he played a, a reasonable move, but a further weakening e6. 
he doesn't really have to worry about white playing d5, and I, I don't think this move was necessary. Missing his golden opportunity to play c5. Rook fd1, now there's no c5. Plays a typical move here, king h8, and then bishop e1. And you see the positional logic. I mean, white wants to keep the bishop pair. He's got the rook over on d1. Now the bishop has this threat to go to either side of the board, e1 or b4. Very powerful bad bishop. That's about the best bad bishop in the world. And black is left without any counterplay whatsoever. And white's even ready to play b4 to just completely um, dismiss any hope of black freeing his position with c5. I'm not sure Beliaski you know, even bothered here playing something like queen b7 because he figured, well, Portis will probably play b4 anyway. And um, if c5, d takes c, b takes c, b5 with a very strong passed uh, combo of pawns for white. That's that's a typical kind of pawn structure that's very bad for black. If white plays b4, black plays c5, d takes c, b takes c, b5, white's ready for a4, a5, and a very strong passed pawn. So this is where the passive, the passive shuffling begins. Again, similar to my featured game earlier, on the YouTube channel, Kramnik against, against Anish Giri, Rook c8. This is a bad sign when an active player like Beliavsky is playing Rook c8 off of the half-open file. Bishop d3. This could blow up the pawn structure at e4 at some moment. It also opens the c-line for the rooks to target the pawn, the weakness he's created along the c-file. And Beliavsky here not really liking the fact that his pawn structure can get further weakened. He plays knight back to f6, tries to keep a kind of tight position with his pieces. King h1, good prophylactic move, and rook g8. And Belly asks you, I don't think this is really about attacking, just about maximizing the potential of his pieces, and also maybe even thinking about defense. I mean, if white's preparing h3 and g4, ultimately that's obvious here. Um, Black can try to stop g4 directly, or perhaps just use the rook to protect his king. Rook c2, and uh, it's not always that you know that difficult to see what what um, kind of like Capablanca, right? I mean, you always knew what he was going to do, but you just couldn't stop it. It's a Portish. That's kind of how Portish plays. You know what he's doing, but it gets to the point where there's just his momentum, and it can't stop. You just can't stop it, even though every move it's clear, you know, how he's improving and closing in on you. Um, knight to d5, shuffling again. Queen f3, Karpovian kind of like improving the position by one square at a time. The queen's a little bit better, the rook's a little bit better, and um, it's getting there. Queen f3 and bishop f8. Now the proud Grunfeld bishop has abandoned the long diagonal. His only chance, this is reasonable actually, um, Belyowski played a reasonable game. His only chance is to get in c5 to crack the white center. A3, and I don't know if, if maybe C5 here, but he's obviously maybe concerned a white might double rooks. So bishop D6 first. Um, the bishop's kind of a dead piece on D6 anyway. He's obviously never going to play F6 and E5. So I think that bishop D6 is just kind of a waiting move. And bishop F1, also a waiting move. Defending the king side, I think Portish wants to open up all the different possibilities for himself and he protects his g2 square so bishop f1 and then black really doesn't know what to do here he can just play something like rook g6 kind of sit and wait but um, it's clear that white has has a very big advantage and black has really no active counterplay other than the somewhat risky move um, c5 but I should mention there is one important point to bishop d6 that Beliaski played White is threatening sometimes, although it's anti-positional. Um, it, it could have been a dangerous threat for White there to play e4. e4 with the bishop back on f8, followed by pawn takes e4, queen takes e4. Uh, in some positions, might or bishop takes e4, might be very dangerous for Black, opening up the white squares on both sides of the board for the white unopposed white bishop. So bishop d6, I think, has to do something with controlling f4 and stopping e4. But a5 is another move that's weakening, and it's a sign that I, he wants to stop b4. But it's a sign that Beliaski doesn't really know what to do. He has no active plan. Bishop f2. This actually is, is a lot more poisonous than it looks. Um, there is a line where this comes into play a little bit later. 
Bishop f2, kind of just waiting, maybe e4 at some point. But uh, he knows that black really can't do anything constructive. So he's, you know, if black's going to keep weakening himself with pawn moves like a5, I think by just making a waiting move here, um, Portish is sort of just encouraging him. Rook c7, and okay, now we see that maybe Beliaski really is preparing uh, c5. h3 and queen c8. Um, a strange similarity again with Kramnik against Anish Giri. Rook on d to c1, and as dangerous as it looks, Beliaski goes for it here. He frees his position with c5. When Portish misses a really difficult computer variation, this, this is almost impossible for anyone to see, but um, the very best players in the world who are, who are the sharpest tactically, why well, could have played bishop d3, and in this line, it's it's really tricky. Um, the point is pawn takes, and then um, e4. And the point of that, it looks crazy, but um, it opens up the bishop on f2. There's all these lines with bishop takes d4, where the black king just gets like sliced and diced. So you see how that the subtle little move, bishop f2, was actually setting up some really demonic kind of tricks based on this e3, e4. So the quietest move, bishop f2, um, can become a real killer. So bishop d3, Portish did not play that very dangerous move. Um, he played instead d takes c5. We'll give him a break. He's 73 years old, playing against a guy who's like around 2600 still. A uh, pretty tough opponent. So d takes c5. Rook takes c5. Black gets to trade a set of rooks. Keeps the advantage uh, under, like, a clear advantage for white. Rook takes c5. Bishop takes c5. Beliowski, a tremendous tactical player. He's not going to miscalculate too much. So he sees, obviously, that white doesn't have b4. Uh, he can evacuate his queen to d8. Next move, if everything's okay. Here, e4 is interesting. I think white has a slight edge after e4. Pawn takes e4. Queen takes e4. That's a very simple variation, and I'm sure Portish considered it. But he decided that a different move was, was better, so he played bishop c4 instead, while threatening to win a clear pawn, obviously. And, uh, and knight f6, and the interesting thing about this little occurrence, it may not seem that significant, is it does weaken black control over b4. So after knight f6 now, he could play bishop e1, transferring to the, the diagonal where the black king is. This happens next move. He could have played it right away. Bishop e1, it's maybe strongest. Bishop e1, idea b4, bishop c3, lots of good stuff. The two bishops looking, despite the semi-block structure, looking very good. I think right about here, Belioski is sort of kicking himself. Why did I take with a g-pawn on f, you know, on f5? Maybe I shouldn't have done this. <laughs> but it's getting kind of open, and the two bishops are looking pretty strong. So very tense game, bishop d3, stopping knight e4, threatening to win directly, of course, with b4, threatening e4, accumulating, his positional advantage is accumulating um, like a snowball and uh, down a hill. And there's really not a lot Beliaski can do. He tries to hang on. So here, queen f8, this was a mistake. It's not really a great square. The black pieces aren't well coordinated. So Beliaski missed this move. This was the star move to save the game, probably. Queen a8. And after queen a8, um, white's slightly better, but I think that black's okay. Queen a8 seems to hold the balance in this position. So I, I don't know if maybe bishop h4 here. Yeah, bishop h4. I looked at this. King g7. Maybe Belieski was scared of this, and that's why he like decided not to uh, to go for queen a8. It's a little frightening. Bishop takes f6, king takes f6, and e4. But the opposite bishops are on the board, and the black king can go back to e7, and it looks like the white is slightly better. It might be very hard for him to make progress here. So I could see both sides kind of misevaluating this sort of line thinking it's dangerous in some in some analysis or something. Looks like black walks away, so 
Queen a8 was the last really good chance for black after that continuation. Um, bishop d3. Queen f8, not as good. And now black's really under the gun. Bishop e1 with huge threats. Um, bishop c3, b4, e4 opening up the position. If I get in bishop c3, even g4 is going to be on the way. The whole position just starts to look like all of four of white's pieces are perfectly coordinated. The bishop pair works. Believsky's hanging on by a thread. He plays rook g6. I think they're both in time pressure here. Bishop c3 and king g8 is only move. And again, probably near time, time control. Bishop e5. Portis just kind of probing the position. Believsky repeating. And then time control, bishop c3. Um, back to knight f6 and move 41 e4 with a clear advantage to white. So pulling the trigger, not taking a draw. 73-year-old Lyosh Portish going for the win against Alexander Belyavsky. And who can blame him? A very inspiring game. e4, pawn takes e4, bishop takes e4, raking two bishops. Belyavsky has to take. And queen takes e4. And this is a tough position for black. He only really has one move here. So you have to find it Queen to d8, to the open file. But to be fair to Believsky, I think um, I think queen d8, he might have seen queen e5 and kind of freaked out, which is understandable. Um, it, it looks very bad for black, but he might be able to survive after king f8 and just walk away, like in the other variation. King f8, um, queen h8 check, I looked at this. And white goes a pawn up in an ending. After king e7, you can't take on h7 because black will take the initiative with queen d5 and probably mate white by force. So you have to trade queens. And Portish would have, he's a very good endgame technician. Um, he would have had very good winning chances here after bishop takes a5. Basically, he worked the whole game to win a pawn. Um, after bishop takes a5, looks like good winning chances. I would say king d7, um, bishop back to d2, bishop d4 something like this, or maybe instead of bishop d4, you could play h5, trying to hold the um, hold the white pawns, freeze the white pawns, and I looked here at, I think, a4, bishop d4, bishop c3, trade bishops in a rook ending, and h4, where white's close to winning, uh, clear advantage to white, good winning chances, I'm not sure if it's a win or not, but really marginal. Difficult to hold for black, but possible that it's a draw. Um, would take a really perfect technique. In the actual game, here, finally, Belyowski blundered. He played queen d6, which I think is forgivable for anyone. Seeing the threat of queen e5 on the long diagonal, he played queen d6, and Portish finished him off with b4. b4 almost trapping the bishop. Of course, Belyowski probably checked to see he had a square, but it doesn't really matter. Um... After b4, a takes b4, a takes b4. In the chess database, uh, it says queen f8 was played here by uh, Belyowski, but that's not actually the case. In in reality, I think uh, it was just a, a digital board kind of mishap, something like that, um, or mistake in, in annotation. So I believe he just resigned here after a takes b4. Uh, there's no reason he would have ever played queen f8 in this position. So the point is black resigns. His bishop has only f2 to go to, and then rook a1 is just absolutely and completely terminal for black. So there, there's just zero chance of surviving this position with the open king against the queen, rook, and bishop on the back rank and long diagonal. Black is done here. So Portish takes out uh, Believsky after losing many games in the 90s, comes back at age 73 in a beautiful positional display. This was back in 2010, guys. Uh, the Gotthard Cup in Sinkotard, Hungary. Lajos Portish, beautiful game against Alexander Belyavsky, and I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Two wonderful players. I highly recommend you check out all their games. Two of my favorite players of all time. Thanks for joining us here at Video Chess Training on YouTube. This is International Master Bill Pascal, and I really appreciate it. Please subscribe and give me a like for this video. We'll see you guys later in Grandmaster Chess Lessons. Bye-bye.